Hi, everyone. It's Raghu with Ramdas here and now, and our old friend Danny Goldman is joining us today uh, alongside of Ramdas. And we're going to talk about uh, a, a book that Danny put together with his good friend and uh, partner, Richie Davidson. And it's Altered Traits. Science reveals how meditation changes your mind, brain, and body. And we've been trying to do this with Danny for many months, uh, one reason or another. Here we are today. Uh, it's an auspicious day, though. It's the last day of, of 2017, so uh, New Year's Eve we're doing this. And um, before Danny gets into talking about the core of what this book is and the purpose, uh, I thought it'd be fun to talk about, because uh, there's one thing you mentioned in, in the book, how the atmosphere around investigation of consciousness at Harvard. Now, so for those of you, well, I think all of you know that Ramdas was at Harvard and did those experiments with Timothy Leary and then got fired. And then Danny uh, came after that fact, and um, he also was at Harvard. He did not get fired, uh, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but there was, but certainly there was an atmosphere. Can you talk about it? Uh, about the atmosphere, sure. Ramdas? Talk a little bit about what it was like to even bring up that uh, any kind of. Um, the subject around the subject of consciousness. I, uh, well, the faculty, my, my, my fellow faculty members weren't happy. And the the new graduate graduate students were wanting to get to um, Tim and I Tim and me Tim Tim and me Tim <laughs> and <laughs> um, we wanted to get on our. Uh, our psychedelic um, research. And um, they didn't like that for because we were pulling their graduate students. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a behaviorist science and we wanted to do introspective stuff not uh, not a lot of of consciousness in harvard <laughs> period huh <laughs> And when you arrived, Danny, was that well, kind of so, a similar okay, situation? So here's the scenario. <laughs> Ram Dass, then Richard Alpert, and Tim Leary uh, had actually been in the very department I enrolled in five years later. They had traumatized uh, the, the faculty there by making <laughs> them uh, the focus of a, one of the biggest scandals at Harvard, as far as they were concerned. And uh, they were behaving. It was a department that had B.F. Skinner. He was like Mr. Pigeon. You know, you could only study what you could see. And uh, Ramdas and, and uh, Larry were doing something very subversive, which was studying consciousness. So I actually was lucky enough to meet Ramdas. My uh, the first year I was there, it was he had just come back from India as Ramdas, not Richard Alpert, and. Um, he, uh, it was almost, it was really by accident, but accident. I, I see it as divine intervention myself, but uh, I met him the Christmas break and then ended up going to a summer camp. He run at his father's farm up in New Hampshire with, uh, that's where I met Krishna Das and a number of other people who became Nimkoli Baba, Sat Song. I was lucky enough to get a pre-doctoral traveling fellowship from Harvard 
uh, to go to India. And I, uh, once I was there, I met uh, Maharaji. I met uh, people like Kunu Lama, who we can talk about in a bit. I met people who embodied a completely different uh, kind of consciousness and one that really had to do with the positive potential of being human, uh, not the negative <laughs> parts, which is what I was studying in clinical psychology. It was, you know, what's wrong with this person was what we were studying rather than mm. what could be right. Yeah, yeah, right. And anyway, when I came back, uh, I really I wanted to study this and I felt meditation was really the key. And I said, I want to do my dissertation on meditation. And they kind of recoiled for the most part. I think, Ramdas, this was maybe <laughs> you. I don't know exactly. But uh, there was only one faculty member, David McClelland, who was a, a dear friend, too. And uh, Ramdas, you had been the godfather to uh, his, his two twin sons. He had hired you to Harvard. You'd been with him at uh, Wesleyan, as I recall. And anyway, uh, David was a meditator. His wife, Mary, was a Quaker. She was practically a saint herself. And, mm. uh, and so I was able to go ahead and do it with him kind of covering for me. In fact, he covered for me on my traveling fellowship. But it, it was hard. And, and the faculty there said, you know, this is a career-ending move as far as they were concerned. I remember, Ram Dass, <laughs> <laughs> when I first met you, I was up at your father's farm, and you were going through your mail. And you had um, something from the American Psychological Association asking if you wanted to renew your membership. And you very pointedly asked me, should I do this or not? I, I'm <laughs> sure I didn't do it. But, you know, I stayed in the profession and I, you know, got my doctorate. And uh, Richie Davidson, who did the book with me, was a fellow graduate student. He used to go to Ram Dass's lectures and his classes in Cambridge. He was very influenced by Ram Dass, too. He became a neuroscientist. And when we did our dissertations at Harvard, there are like three articles that we could cite. Today, there are more than 6,000. And the book, Altered Traits, weeds through those 6,000, get like 1% that are tip top, you know, uh, ir irrefutable in A level journals. And, and it's a very good story it tells. Mm. Maybe now's a good time just to say a little bit about the purpose and the core of the book uh, just in a general way so everybody understands what we're talking about well the the book altered traits looks at all of the scientific research on meditation um, and shows that there is uh, there's a very strong effect starting from the beginning people get better in their attention and their stress recovery uh, and this by the way is a non-spiritual book it just is the scientific look at all of this. Uh, the more you, <laughs> oy vey, Ram Dass is saying. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, it, but it, it makes a very strong case in the culture that meditation can be pursued. And the more you do it, the stronger the effects get. When you look at yogis, they're really uh, quite remarkable. Uh, and we have data on them too. So it shows beginner, intermediate, which is someone with a day job who meditates every day, maybe does a retreat once a year. And then Olympic level of the yogis. And it was really inspired by Maharaji, uh, Nim Kroli Baba, who I was uh, blessed enough to have a chance to be with in India. Raghu, you were there. Ram Das, of course, was there. Uh, and he was, uh, unlike anyone I'd ever met in my life, he, he was totally present and uh, equanimous and happy for no particular reason and loving unconditional love. Ram Dass, I, I so appreciate your mantra, I am loving awareness. I am loving awareness. I am loving awareness because Maharaji embodied that. And if, yeah. as we all remember when we were with him, we were loving awareness too. I mean, it was contagious. It was, mm -hmm. it went viral person to person. Uh, and uh, we loved people who were, who were with us. And, uh, it, and that was one of the qualities of consciousness that I was hoping to interest psychology in. 
when I went back? How could this be? How could, how could a person evolve to the point where they, they had these attributes and you felt this when you were with them? Hmm. You know, there's a great thing in the book. I'd love, Ram Dass, maybe you can comment on a, just a couple of lines about Maharaji. Uh, Maharaji seemed always to be absorbed in some state of ongoing, quiet rapture, and paradoxically, at the same time, was attentive to whoever was with him. Just a, a simple line like that really, really does uh, say it all. And, and we talked a little bit before about mm. looking, at just that's a very, it's, there's a simplicity to that. I, that's why I love that statement, Danny, uh, about Maharaji, without all of the, the yoga powers and all of that other kind of right. stuff. You know, it's so it's beautiful in, in that respect. And right. Ramdas, maybe j just comment a little bit. About, I mean, it seems to me you and in your own practice right now uh, have really um, taken on. And as you, we, Danny just mentioned loving awareness, which this to me embodies that. But how Maharaji reveals the the potential of a human and and that was such a big part of what happened to uh, to many of us that were there at that time that many of us have hopefully brought back some little seed of um can you talk about how that seed was you you did bring that back initially that's the only reason danny and i and many others made it that's over right. to, to right. meet him um <clears throat> He demonstrated that we have consciousness on many planes of, uh, and in fact, I've never, my sadhanam is him. And uh, I meet him at every plane of consciousness I can reach. Hmm. He was, he was like this, or like this. Hmm. He was, he was, he was somewhere else, uh, somewhere else, and then he'd be right here with you in the problem. And there's some place else. Showered uh, this plane. So that, so that I, I guess, uh, I guess I, I, in, in, I felt introduced from what he, he read my mind. So that's, that's the city. And, um, then uh, I he, he he would I was sitting in the grass in front of his tucket and and I looked up at him and and his eyes which were I see them as the windows of the soul. He, his eyes expressed a tremendous love, a tremendous love. I had never been loved by anyone in my whole life because I had conditional love, conditional love. I earned my love by 
I, I was a good boy or a good student and I was a good something, good lover. Uh, and here he was, he gave us, he gave, gave me love. And he didn't care whether I, whether I was a good or bad. Boy, yum, 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 yum. <laughs> hmm. um, one of the other interesting things that you brought up, uh, obviously it's a major factor for you and for Richie, was encountering Vipassana meditation. And... Uh, and we all, Maharaji, without saying a word, somehow, all of us had that formal training back in the day, and, and many of us have kept up with it. What, I'm, I, and on top of all of that, at that, uh, of course, there's the famous story of uh, I wasn't at the first meditation um, retreats uh, when Ram Dass, y'all couldn't find Maharaji and I, I was uh, at Sri Aurobindo Ashram doing another thing. But uh, it was there at that time where these incredible friends of ours, you know, Joseph Goldstein and Sharon Salzberg and eventually Jack Cornfield, all of that was like this incredible cauldron from which... Uh, which is like today, where we do these retreats, Ramdas and Krishnas and all of us in Maui with these people that came from that That's moment. Right. So there's a lot of power to that meditative practice. What do you what do you think, Danny, about how 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 important that was and and what it really represented for us um, going forward and bringing it back to the U.S. Right. Well, so we all had Darshan of Maharaji and we're blown away as Ram Dass eloquently put it. But um, the question was, how did he get there? And we know he did years of sadhana and, you know, supposedly he meditated five years in a lake or he did, you know, many stories about that. But he, he had done practice. And so what was the practice we could do? Well, Krishna Das and I accidentally ended up in Bodhgaya. And it just happened to be uh, a couple of weeks before a Goenkaji was invited by his friend Manindra, who was a Bengali Buddhist who lived in Bogaya, to come and give a retreat. And so we immersed ourselves in that practice, which is a wonderful practice. And as you say, that led to the mindfulness movement in America today, which is, is a spinoff of, of the insight meditation uh, that Joseph and Sharon and Jack and, and others uh, brought to America at that time. And somehow it intermingled with the Maharaji satsang. So many members of the satsang came to Bodh Gaya or, or uh, did uh, insight meditation or some form of that. And then I found out years later that Maharaji had taken care of a Tibetan Lama, put him on retreat in 1959 before he met any Westerners took care of him for two years. He kept him with them and they were very close. Um, Maharaji, I don't think he made the distinctions. Uh, he used to say subek, it's all the same. But as they say these days, the very best meditation is the one you'll do. It doesn't <laughs> matter what it is, just do it. And I think that's what he was saying, find your path. If you're Christian, stay Christian. He never said become Hindu. He never said become a bhakti. He never said, uh, you know, you must do this or that. What he said was, you should follow a path, whatever path that might be. And a lot of us ended up, as you said, uh, following Buddhist paths. And as it turns out in the book, Altered Traits, most of the research is on one or another form of Buddhist meditation, uh, mindfulness for beginners, uh, insight or Zen for long term and then the Tibetan yogis, I think that's just a happenstance. There's so many kinds of meditation. Uh, there's a devotion, there's guru yoga, there's uh, zikr in the Sufis, there's, you know, it's endless. There, every spiritual tradition has many, many kinds. Uh, and I think it's an accident uh, of science that we happen to 
have a lot of data on one particular form. What's very telling to me is that we know it increases your attentional and concentration capacities. It makes you more equanimous and stress resistant, makes you more loving and generous if you do a, a loving kindness type of meditation. The one thing that is not studied much in the West is selflessness, mm. which is really ironic because every spiritual tradition tells you that becoming less attached, less tuned into yourself, less self-grasping is the, uh, mm. you know, the core of the spiritual path. But because this is being studied, frankly, by materialist scientists who aren't particularly <laughs> doing it within a spiritual tradition, you know, harkens back to the fact that at Harvard, they, they hard-nosed scientists aren't interested in selflessness. They're interested in papers they can publish in, in journals because it helps their career. So <laughs> there's great irony uh, that of the 6,000 articles and the 60 we found to be best, maybe three or four had to do with how this uh, makes you less self grasping self-focused mm. yeah um now a big part of this story as well of course is his holiness the dalai lama um, that that has to be brought in sooner than later and of course we know uh, your relationship or well, let's tell everybody out there danny has had a long-term relationship with his holiness and worked with him particularly at the mind life institute and uh, also written a book just a couple of years ago that came out. Um, and, and, of course, His Holiness has been a, a major advocate of the kind of research that Richie Davidson is doing. Uh, yeah. So yeah, just talk about him a little bit related to this, but more on the side of he's embodying what it is that we all sure. want, you know, want to be. Uh, well, in Bodh Gaya, many of us uh, had the good fortune to meet a very humble lama named Kunu Rinpoche. Mm. Uh, Ramdas, I think you met Kunu. Raghu, you met Kunu. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did. And uh, Kunu was revered by everyone, but he was so humble. He lived in a tiny room, bare room, and had a wooden tucket, you know, plank bed like Maharaji had a tucket. Kunu had a tucket. That was his, where he slept, and that's where he sat during the day. That was his day couch, his night bed. Mm -hmm. And people would come day and night to see him. Didn't matter. He always welcomed them. I, Ram Dass, I thought of my professors at Harvard. You could see them, too, uh, Tuesdays 2 to 3 on office hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, so Kunu, who had been offered the, uh, the suite at the top of the monastery with a full-time attendant and turned it down to stay in this bare cell, turned out to be the Dalai Lama's teacher on compassion. He was the one who taught him the, teach the uh, text of Shantideva, which uh, the Dalai Lama to this day still loves to teach and always thanks Kuna Rinpoche as his teacher. So the Dalai Lama, who I met in the 80s, um, actually through Robert Thurman, who was an old friend of Ram Dass. I remember RD when we met uh, Bob and Nena and kids in uh, Almora on the way down from Kosani. Raghu, I don't know if you were there that day, but uh, we, we were going down to Kenshi from this little village where we had stayed. And uh, there they were in a VW minibus. Uma was about two. She was in diapers. This was a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So at any rate, uh, Bob introduced me to Dalai Lama, who at that time in the 80s said he was very interested in science and meeting scientists. So I became part of a group that was uh, now it's called the Mind and Life Institute, which has organized more than 30 meetings between the Dalai Lama and scientists. Originally, they were tutorials. And uh, now the scientists come really to learn from him because he has such a strong ethical stance and is also a very good intuitive scientist. But at one of those meetings, he turned to Richie Davidson and said, my tradition has many methods for handling destructive emotions. I encourage you to take them out of the spiritual context, bring mm -hmm. them to the lab, study them rigorously. And if they're of value to people, spread them as widely as you can. That, I think, is why there are now so many studies of meditation. 
uh, and even though it's in a secular lens, I think it's okay because it's beneficial. It helps people. You know, it, uh, meditation is good as medication for depression and anxiety. Meditation helps people uh, be more equanimous, more loving. Why not spread it? Why, it doesn't have to be in a spiritual context. I look at the book Altered Traits. It's essentially 60 reasons to meditate. Mm -hmm. And if you're a beginner, you know, here's 30. If you're intermediate, here's another 30 for why to keep doing it. And it, this is where it will get you to if you look at the yogis. So uh, it, it essentially is in the service of the Dalai Lama's call to spread meditation practice as widely as you can. And the way I see it is if you do it just for, uh, you know, uh, reasons of you want to feel better, that's okay. Or it's relieving suffering, your own. If it's making you more loving, then it's spreading well-being. And if it leads you to a spiritual path, all the better. Mm. Well, I, there may be one thing that's not in the out of the sixty reasons to meditate. Uh, I think Ramdas, I'm going to prompt you for one reason that uh, perhaps is not in the book. Uh, uh, I didn't come across it, but you never know. And it has to do with uh, the fact that we were introduced to Vipassana, and uh, and Maharaj used to say, "You go into the course," in, and he'd say that in English, "Course." Go to the course. It's like, like get out of here and get out of my face. <laughs> Do something else. And, uh, you know, so Ramdas, how about, uh, remember you've talked about those long uh, retreats that you did in Burma and how uh, coming out of them, how they affected your the practice of bhakti yoga. Maybe talk about that a little. Talk about one. It's, a, uh, I think, a major well, thing for us. The, those practices in Burma, I got my concentration, concentration uh, trait. Um, <laughs> That's good. Uh, with sharp, sharp, sharp. I can I concentrate it on my breath. <clears throat> and I go when get back to Maharaji and then I notice that I concentrated on him. <laughs> and I was my 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 heart was full by concentrating on him. Sorry, is, is that one of you? <laughs> <laughs> that was Raghu <laughs> barking. Sorry about that. That's part of our podcast <laughs> protocol here. Go ahead. Sorry. Um. Uh, an experience I had with Maharaji. One summer, I um, I w wanted to go to Kosani because there was a meditation teacher up there who was, who was going to spend there spend the summer. Danny mentioned Menindra, and I um, made a, a pact with Melindra, Menindra that he was going to be, <clears throat> that I was going to be just get beginning to meditate under his um, teaching. And um, so I went to Maharaji and I said, 
I have I have a very wonderful meditation teacher from and I think I'll go somewhere somewhere there. And he said this is the he said if you want if you want that's the that's the that, that's the, the worst thing from kiss him. of death right kiss of death <laughs> yeah. and i went well i i want <laughs> <laughs> and that was the way he was trying to get, get me to be a bhakti yogi he was going to the summer that, that summer he was going to train me and he, he, he just wanted, and then he said, didn't you meditate uh, in Burma or did you, uh, United States? I said, yeah. He said, enough. Enough, enough meditation. <laughs> Danny, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, also, you didn't mention uh, Manindra, who you were going to Kosani to study meditation with, did not show up. No, that's right. <laughs> not. <laughs> and Maharaji may have known he wasn't going to come. <laughs> <laughs> so he saw the whole folly of the thing. Uh, yeah, and uh, let me add, too, another thing you forgot. You were going up there. It was actually going to be you. Well, first it was you and Danny and Krishna Das and Ramesh, and then he sent me. He said, okay, you go, too. So it was me and Balaram Das ended up there, too. We had just shown up. So it was going to be okay with you. And uh, at that point, you had just heard Manindra was not coming. And then the reality is... <laughs> Never mind the fact that, I mean, you became the de facto meditation teacher, okay? The last thing in the world you wanted to do was to, you know, handle all these young Western hippies who were like wildly, uh, I mean, Krishnas and Danny had you know, been at the course, so it, it Ramesh. But it ended up Maharaji sent about 30 people. He kept sending them, go meditate with Ramdas and Kosani. And after each person that came, that, that put your blood pressure a little bit higher every day, <laughs> you were having to deal with that. But you know what? I'll say something because I had not been at the course. I went to the course later. Okay? This is a reality. When we stayed, Danny was staying in a, his own, you got your own little house there on the hill. But we were in that house on top of the hill. You had to go down like, you know, 300 yards to pull up all this water because they had no water. And there was a little cow shed that we had as our meditation uh, hut that supposedly Herikan Baba had meditated in, a you know, at the earlier part of that century. So me, I'm brand new, and Ramdas is my meditation teacher. He so he taught me the the basic uh, Anapana practice and a little bit of Vipassana practice, uh, scanning and all. And uh, within three days, I had the first absolutely um, real. I had been doing TM or something when I was in America. Nothing happened. And for the first time, I had an absolutely uh, somewhat of a transcendent experience in the first few days of meditating in that hut with you. Okay? So, uh, well, uh, that just proves that there was something going on as uh, aside from Maharaji busting your ass that whole time up in Kosani, it really was. <laughs> you're right. You're right. You're right. <laughs> Which is a lot of what I, I, Maharaji did. 
I was. I didn't. Uh, uh, we were in the top of the mountain. Yeah. And the uh, and um, the bus came in from from the, the, the and. And Nanny you could me. look down, look down, and Westerners, Westerners, Westerners. I was, I was, I said to, to all of you, let's not be, tell them we're here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't work. And it didn't work. And we got to the Gandhi ashram. Yeah, and we had a wonderful summer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and we can't. Uh, there hasn't been a book written about what happened then, and we probably can't talk about it just yet. <laughs> if you remember, oh boy. Well, getting back to the to the book a little bit, um, I think that there there's one essential um, uh point that we need to talk about because it's it's a byword today of course and that's mindfulness and uh so danny you do talk about mindfulness related to some of the uh experiments that are being done and so on and differentiating it i think is a an important uh, point. So maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So it, it turns out that mindfulness, the term mindfulness is translated many, many different ways. But in America now, today, it's taken on a particular meaning. Some people think mindfulness is meditation, that all kinds of meditation are mindful. That's just not true. Uh, and the mindfulness definition that's taken hold uh, most strongly is one from our friend John Kabat-Zinn, where mindfulness is just simply noting what's going on in the moment without judging uh, and without following your thoughts and just staying present. And it turns out that his particular form of mindfulness, which is mindfulness-based stress reduction, uh, is the subject of, of the most, uh, most studies for beginners on meditation because it's a neat eight week program. It's in a manual, you can repeat it in different places. Uh, but mindfulness has lots of meanings in, in meditation practice. Some uh, are quite contrary to the way it's understood uh, in, in everyday parlance and the common understanding. So uh, mindfulness is well studied for beginners and it does pay, it, as I said, it, it helps you recover more quickly from stress, be less reactive, focus more, learn better, increase memory, does all those things. It's true. But as you proceed in the very practice of the posture insight meditation, the one we're studying in Bodh Gaya, uh, the mindfulness that you learn at the beginning becomes just one tool uh, of the mind in uh, kind of creating a platform in consciousness to see what's going on. And that, as I said, is just one of many, many different varieties of meditation. So when you get to another level, Ron Bess and I had, when I last visited in Maui, had a really amazing, I thought amazing conversation about the parallels between the practice of I am loving awareness and, and what I've been doing in, with Tibetan teachers, where the, the I and the Tibetan uh, frame would be empty essence, which means you don't identify with the small I, the I, the I, me, mine I, but uh, you let go of that. And you have a different flavor of I. And then the uh, awareness, uh, which is just the knowing capacity of mind. And then the loving part, which is compassion, that actually the Tibetan practice is designed to cultivate those three things. And those three qualities kind of intermingled. And the yogis that have been studied that I, I talk about in the book, these are yogis that were flown over from Nepal or India one by one to Richie's brain lab. Their, their brains function differently. Their consciousness is, differently, is different uh, very clearly. And they do have those qualities that we experience with Maharaji or with Kunu. 
So something goes on if you become a full-time practitioner, which is very profound and which changes your being, which changes the brain, it turns out, but in ways we're just beginning to understand. Uh, but it, I think it's very hopeful. And for me, it's full circle because I was first inspired by Maharaji and by Kunu to bring this back to the West and see what, what could be of use here. And then the science itself is now coming around to study uh, the very top level practitioners. And it's showing that there is something going on in consciousness and in the brain and probably beyond the brain, we don't know, that has to do with those qualities that we all experience when we were in India. Mm. By the way, uh, Danny introduces a, a one particular, a couple of major people who were studied. Uh, one is Mathieu Ricard, um, who's a French Tibetan monk, who's an amazing man. But also uh, a Tibetan Lama named Mingyur Rinpoche. Right. And uh, as many people as possible, you should read or he teaches around the country. I, I would uh, I myself have not had a, uh, an in-person uh, possibility yet, uh, but I have read uh -huh. uh, uh, his uh, he comes from a family when, when this is really interesting to me. Uh, his father is Tulku Urgi and Rinpoche and uh, he has a couple of brothers, Choki Nimya, Nim, Nima. Nimya, Danny, help me out on that one. Nima, Choki Nima. Choki yeah. Nima, yeah. Anyhow, uh, it, it's uh, the the uh, it's astounding that this family had these amazing, amazing people who their meditation um, capabilities and and their practice uh, is just extraordinary. But what's so to me, hit me so um, directly as a bullseye. Uh, Danny describes, Danny and Richie describe in the book when Mingyur Rinpoche came over and they did, you know, they put on all of the apparatus so that they could measure him when, he, and, right. and, they, and they would say, okay, so go into a compassion meditation. And of course, you know, and we're not talking about he had to go in and first get concentrated and then, you know, move from there into a greater work. Nothing. Bang. He was right, right there. That's amazing. Start That's with right. that. That's right. And then how the, 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 the readings just went completely off the charts right away. The, the, the explosive nature of, of his compassion. But you know what got me more than anything than that, which is phenomenal, is, is your description, or Richie's, whoever, of him in the room with everyone else. Kindness. Caring. With That's everybody, right. and, and you know, and some of it, you know, going into what MRI thing, whatever it was, it took a while to set up. You know, he could easily have gotten irri right. irritable, and so on. And and this being a, a true measure of uh, of of what meditation can yeah. bring is probably more essential in this uh, in this book for me than than uh, anything else, and certainly the compassion quotient. Well, Matthew Ricard, who has a PhD from, you know, the MIT of France, but then became a monk and, and meditated for all his life. He's the one who made it possible. He invited these people. Uh, Mingyur, uh, who some of us were fortunate enough to study with, his brothers, Chokinima and Sokni Rinpoche, Sokni. are fantastic teachers. But he was, of all the uh, people in the study, and in the Olympic level, which was 12,000 to 62,000 lifetime hours, he was the 62,000. All of them were able to go immediately into whatever it was, compassion, visualization, concentration, open presence. They do it immediately. It wasn't like you or me, you know, we settle ourselves down to meditate. Maybe our mind wanders. Not, nothing like that. As you said, they're right there. And then their brains were very different. Uh, as, I, as you mentioned, uh, they showed some things that had never been seen by science before. Uh, for example, uh, this particular EEG wave called the gamma wave. It's the strongest one. It's rarely seen. When you have a great creative insight, you get gamma for half minute, half second, actually. And mm -hmm. they have it in their EEG all, all the time. When Minger went into compassion, his gamma went up by seven to 800%. 
Never before in the annals of science has this happened. And, mm. you know, these are just what we happen to be able to measure. I, I don't think it all reduces to gamma at all. I think that's just a tiny peek into the, the qualities of consciousness. I mean, we have no idea what Maharaji's brain was like. We know what his being was yeah. like. And as you say, these people were like that. They were very kind. They're very thoughtful. When Matthew was in the fMRI for about three and a half hours the first time, usually people go in for 15 minutes to a half hour. And some people are frightened to go in at all because it's a human cigar tube with a giant, noisy, clanky magnet going around you. A lot of people can't take it. Matthew came out after three and a half hours. We thought he'd be fried. He said, oh, that was so delightful. It was like a mini <laughs> retreat. You know, he was just unflappable. <laughs> those are the kind of qualities that really, you know, tell you someone has, someone is someplace. Yeah. Like Maharaj. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Oh, there, there's one interesting thing here. Uh, I think you and uh, Sharon Salzberg, uh, of course, Sharon is so well known for her loving kindness practice that she's really introduced yes. widely here in the United States, especially. And I think you were together with His Holiness. And um, and she mentioned at one point, Sharon told the Dalai Lama that many Westerners felt loathing towards themselves. He was astonished. That's He'd right. never heard of this. He had, the Dalai, Ram, uh, Dalai Lama replied, always assumed that people naturally love themselves. <laughs> Yet in English, the word compassion, the, uh, the Dalai Lama pointed out, signifies the wish that others be well, but that it does not include oneself. He explained that in his own language, Tibetan, as well in the classical tongues of Pali and Sanskrit, the word compassion implied feeling this for oneself as well as others. English, he added, needs a new word, self-compassion. So, Ramdas, right. we've, we've, we've gone back and forth about this uh, recently, actually. What, what, uh, just a comment about uh, self-compassion before you can have any compassion towards anybody or not or what? In bhakti language you have to skip from this 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 plane of consciousness we are talking on now and wanted to skip to the next plane which is which is bhakti and I call it uh, Soul Land. And, and in the Soul Land, uh, well, the first thing, this, this, um, Maharaji instructed me. This is this is this is the only instruction he gave to me. He said, "Ramdas, love everybody." They, I, I said, Maharaji, I can't do that. I was just identifying with my judge. And he said, Ramdas, I'm telling you, love everybody. And tell the truth. And that That instruction guided my guided my sadhana years since I had been instructed that way. And when he came, when I was soul land, 
I found, I saw, loves everybody and, and tells the truth. Yeah. The question is, does it include you in, in that practice? Are you included when you extend yourself? Yeah, when you, you get into the soul land, the, the first thing is, I am a soul. Like, I am loving awareness is, is really the soul. And then I say to everybody, once you have the, the I identify with that trait, you can look, look at anybody mm. and you will see their soul. Right. Right. And that's, and that's, and you, souls love, love one another. Uh, Danny, I, this is not, not Buddhism. <laughs> <laughs> But it's true. It's true. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I beg to differ, too. I, I mean, the, when we're talking about the practice of meditation, uh, and Danny mentions this and Richie throughout the book, that none of this, uh, it has to come with, as we talked about before, someone like Matthew Ricard that they did so many mix experiments with, and Mingyur Rinpoche, they, the, the it's not that they could do these things and and show you know wonderful scientific results yeah. ultimately it's because they were kind and caring people that's yeah. that is 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 the essence of i think what you're getting across with this book yeah and that, I, I think that um, it actually is buddhism I mean, buddhism emphasizes loving and, and compassion but i think it's every religion uh, Judaism, Christianity, Hinduism. Yeah. I think every yeah. great major religion has that as, yeah. a, as part of its core message. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think there's one thing. Yeah, we're, we're getting close to uh, our allotted time here, but there's one thing, Danny, in this book that uh, you, you do need to uh, elucidate a little bit, uh, and it's around, and it's one of the 60 results potentially of meditation uh, and you have here's a little quote as a Sufi teacher put it when occupied with self you are separated from God the way to God is but one step the step out of yourself and then you write such a step out of the self technically speaking suggests weakening activation of the default circuitry that binds together this is great. The mosaic of memories, thoughts, impulses, and other semi-independent mental processes into the cohesive sense of me yes. and mine. The stuff of our lives becomes less sticky as we shift into a less yes. attached relationship towards all that. And, and I, I would say, when people ask me, you've done decades of work on yourself, supposedly, what would you say your outcome is now? Would you what, what can you say? And I would say exactly this: the stuff of my life has become less sticky. Period. I mean, I think that that is an extraordinary, extraordinarily important um, statement around practice of of meditation. Or, or well, yes, I think it offers us all a measuring stick. I mean, Ramdas has been saying for decades be less attached. 
And the stickiness is another way of talking about that. If you're, if you're attached, it's sticky. And if you're not, it's not. And the question is, are you finding you're less stuck or more stuck as time goes on? And that's a good yeah. measure of the, uh, the traits that, evolve, that come as a result of practice, whatever that practice may be. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and there, there is um, another, uh, just another one. There's some nice uh, quotes here, and this in uh, in the book. Uh, and there's one here from Fran- Francis de Sa- Frances de Sales, a 16th century Catholic saint. So I like when you know we're bringing in stuff that's not necessarily directly Buddhist, to say the least. If the heart wanders or is distracted. Bring it back to the point quite gently, and if you did nothing during the whole of your hour but bring your heart back, though it went away every time, your hour would be very well employed. I think that's a great uh, adv- a great advice for yeah. meditators. I yeah. mean, and Ram Dass, this is something every retreat we have, every session that you do, you bring that exact point back around loving yep. awareness, right? Yeah. 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 Um, you know, there's another, uh, uh, just just you, sort of a, to me, the big, a big, big important point you make in the book is that these beings that inspired you, us, from the early days, are treasures you call them and That's treasures right. that we need yeah. to um, care for and and care for the environments by which these treasures could actually flourish well you know when we were all in india in the 70s i remember meeting young indians who were eager to go to america to become engineers and we were all there for the spiritual treasure of india and I think the, one of the great unspoken trends of our time is toward materialism and away from a spiritual sensibility. And I feel that any culture or any context, any ashram, whatever it may be, that actually treasures, protects, nurtures, and promotes the spiritual path is a special jewel that that we need more and more of in the world. And that uh, I, I really hope that they will be protected, that they will be preserved, because I see that as uh, maybe one of the great hopes going into the future. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and I think this book, Altered Traits, the essence of uh, the potential of human beings that we have met that actually have become what, uh, I mean, the, the, of course, the biggest example of this is, and the most well-known is His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, that whenever you're with him, and it doesn't, you don't have to be one-on-one, just I- even with 20,000 uh-huh. people at Madison Square right. Garden, uh, y- you get kindness, you get compassion, you get it. That's right. That, that, that this uh, points to uh, that that's, it is possible by some measure, uh, we don't. If you're not ex- exactly like His Holiness, don't worry. But in this book, altered traits, there are definitely traits that can be uh, re-imprinted through meditation, which uh, I think is the essence of the book. So, well put. Thank you, Raghu. <laughs> Excellent summary. <laughs> Thank you, Danny. Ramdas, <laughs> a last word from you about. Um, well, I, I I remember when I first um, met Maharaji. I had I found that he said to me, "You you won't you won't talk about me." <laughs> I'd rather. You don't talk about me. And he said that. And yet, in the West, 
I talked about him and talked about him and talked <laughs> about him. <laughs> it was like I had a, a jewel and the West and the West didn't have this jewel. And we, we have great, we have great people in, in the West that are, that aren't like, aren't like they, these yogis. And that They're jewels. They're jewels. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you, Danny, for joining our Ramdas Here and Now podcast on Be Here Now Network. Pleasure, Raghu. Thank and, you, RD. And uh, everybody yep. who's who's listening, you'll be able to go to. Uh, to BeHereNowNetwork.com and you'll see the show notes and you'll see the link so you can get altered traits in many different formats, I know. And, uh, and Danny has some other wonderful books, none the least, not the least of which, of course, I think many of you know, uh, Emotional Intelligence. I always I recommend that book. I don't know how many times. I get a lot of mail because of uh, Love, Serve, Remember Foundation. So... Uh, we'll have all of that there for you. And again, thank you. Thank you, Ramdas. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Danny. Wonderful. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste. 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 <laughs> <laughs> this podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening, and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.